So when I was in high school, it was my senior year, I was 5 foot 3, about 95 pounds. I was at the park down the street from my house waiting for the school bus. Usually my boyfriend who was already graduated would drive me to school but he was busy. I later found out that he was cheating on me. Well, there was usually a few of us girls there waiting, but this day I was the only one. So I sat at a bench and had one headphone in and one out so I could listen to my surroundings. I've always been cautious of what's going on around me. As I waited, a black Honda pulled up and I immediately noticed it. I kept an eye on it because I had a bad feeling about it. I wasn't making it obvious that I was watching it because I didn't want to look crazy. But after a few minutes, two big men got out. I immediately texted my boyfriend that I was at the park and these guys were creeping me out. Of course, he didn't text back, so I copy and pasted the same text to my cousin, who was home. I lived with my aunt and two male cousins, unwinding down from the night shift. I wanted someone to know the car make and color, plus it was two men, but I didn't get any responses. When they got out of their car, they started to walk towards me. So I got up from the bench and walked towards the street because the bus was supposed to be there any minute. The driver actually ended up being a little bit late. As I stood by the street, these men walked up to me and I could feel the bad energy. One guy said hello as the other stood there staring me down. I just did a small smile and a nod and then looked away. Then the same guy, I'll call him number one, asked how old I was. I didn't respond. I could tell the other guy, number two, was getting mad that I wasn't feeding into it. Then number one kept asking me yes or no questions, like do you have a boyfriend? Do you live close? Do you do drugs? We have some. Do you want some? And then number two asked me if I knew what the black market was. I felt a cold rush go over my body and I got the chills. Number two, who was quiet the whole time, started to tell me they just got back from Russia, but the way he said it was so scary, almost intimidating. I knew they were from somewhere else, but they had strong accents, but I couldn't pinpoint the place. They kept telling me to go to their car because they have drugs. I said no thank you. Trust me, I wasn't a straight edge in high school, but I was not stupid either. I would never get into somebody's car that I didn't know. Then number one asked if I have a car. I said no and that my bus is almost here. Sorry, I have to go. And by some sort of miracle, the bus rounded the corner and the guys backed off. They had been inching closer and closer as they asked me questions. But before the bus got to me, number one handed me a card and said he has a car shop and to call him sometime if I needed anything. He even stated he'd give me a free car. The card looked shifty and I didn't want to grab it, but I knew I needed that number on it to report it. So I took it and they walked off super fast. Finally, the bus stopped and picked me up. As soon as I got on, I started to cry. I had a complete meltdown to be honest. It was like all the adrenaline was keeping my mind and body aware and focused while the men were there, but as soon as I was safe, my body and mind gave out. Thankfully, there weren't many people on the bus, so the driver calmed me down before we took off and I explained to her what happened. When she looked around for the car, they were gone. She said she saw them around me but thought I knew them because they were so close to my person. The driver called into a dispatch saying that there was an incident so that they could notify the school. She continued to pick all the other students up but when we got to the school she walked me into the office. I was absolutely terrified to be alone. The principal came out and so did campus security. They were so sweet and gentle with me as they brought me back to the principal's office. Both were men and they proceeded to ask me questions about the men, their car and the questions the creeps had asked me. I cried the whole time. Then I pulled out the card the guy gave me and handed it to the principal. He looked at the security and said he was going to call it and act like my dad. So he did. It was on speaker and number one answered. I knew his voice as if it was burned into my brain. It took everything in me not to have a panic attack. The principal asked the guy if he could get him a car at a good price. 
and the guy played dumb. The principal then said his daughter, me, gave him the card, and as soon as he said that, the guy hung up. They tried calling again, and the phone was shut off, then eventually disconnected. I could see a shift in the principal and security as soon as the phone clicked. The security got on his phone and called the police and had them come to the school. It was as if they finally knew it was real, like my crazy story wasn't made up. The principal excused himself and the security guard and they talked for a minute in the hall. I could hear everything that they were saying. She's lucky to be alive. This is serious. We need to call her parents to come get her. When the police got there, they came into the office that I was sitting in and asked me for the story again and in front of the principal and security guard. I feel like they wanted to see if I was being 100% honest, so I obliged. The officers were straight up with me and told me it sounded like they were watching us girls at the park because they chose the one day that one of us were alone. He also said the card was being used as bait to get me to go where they wanted. I felt sick and I couldn't breathe. The school called my aunt, but she didn't pick up. The only person that picked up was my boyfriend. One of the officers talked to him as the other finally got a hold of my aunt. My boyfriend ended up picking me up and taking me home and I cried the whole time. When I got there, my grandma, uncle, aunt, mom and cousins were all out front. The women were all in tears and the men were livid but worried for me. A week later, some girl at another local high school, not far from the park, was saved by other students. She was being dragged into a black Honda by two guys. The other kids stood up and grabbed her and pulled her out of their car. The principal called me into his office, and that's how I found out. They also had the same officers there and had me choose the two guys out in a picture lineup. I pointed them out fast. They were caught. It was, in fact, those two guys that tried grabbing the girl, a freshman girl. I felt worried for her and sad that she went through worse than I did, and I felt almost free again. Still, though, I was scared, but not looking over my shoulder as often. I couldn't believe that they were caught, though. After that, my family teamed up to drive me to school for the rest of the year, and my boyfriend, now ex, also took me some days as well. I'm thankful to be alive and well, and I'm even more thankful that the girl was also saved by those courageous kids at her high school. This happened when I was in high school, a long time ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was 17, I'm female, working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime, and a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, 40s, creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend, so I offer a bouquet. Obviously, it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing, as he came into a flower shop of all things. Then he goes into detail about how he hit her, and asks me if I think it was right to do so. This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing, and asks what I'm doing after I get off of work. I dodge answering and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before closing. It was dark, and from the outside it looked like I was working alone as my co-worker, about 40 years old, female, was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right, and everything felt not right. I then notice he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my co-worker that said, he has a gun, and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she could call the cops. 
I shook my head no, as I felt like it was going to escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm as normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was fairly a small shop and in retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my co-worker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day which gives me his name and information so the police have it for a report because I'm sure as hell going to file one. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's card. He replies, No, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves. We quickly lock the door and watch him sit in the truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom, crying. She called the police who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I then told my best friend at the time what happened and she told her mother. Her mother happened to work with a man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job. It's a large company with government contracts and things having to deal with technology and security. Pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that his company made contact with them about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartments. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there, but in retrospect, totally the right call. Dude came in on Valentine's Day, picked up his order, and I never saw him again. Early last year, I had a strange encounter that you all might find interesting. So quick tidbit about myself. I help people as often as I can, including giving money to homeless people or giving rides to hitchhikers if we're going the same direction. 98% of the time, the worst I've encountered is awkward conversations and being asked if I have meth to sell. No matter what though, I don't mess with people at night or in groups and I keep weaponry on hand, though I've never even needed to show it. This is not one of those times. I lived in a lower income area of my city and only about a half a mile from the local homeless shelter, so I've seen plenty of people in a sad state during the two years I lived there. My apartment building kind of sat in a little valley with a little ravine across the street that deer like to hang out in. They liked our bus shelter on really rainy days. And by the way, I lived on the third floor. So one day I come home. It's blowing snow and around 15 degrees outside. In my entryway is a dude sitting on the staircase. It was obvious he was homeless and looking for a place to warm up as he was wearing four days worth of clothes at once and had two backpacks with him. Not a big deal as long as he's still not there when the building is locked up for the day. Our crappy security consisted of having a lock set up for a 9 to 5 office hour. As I pass him on the staircase, I give him a smile as I do literally every other stranger not screaming at me. He stops me and then tries to talk. Now it's obvious he doesn't speak very good English, but I was able to make out that he was asking for water and that he was waiting for a friend who lived in the building to come home. Yeah, no problem. I head up to my apartment to get water for him, and he follows me. This was a bit uncomfortable, but I was already having a hard time communicating with him, so I let it slide. This is where things go wonky. My apartment was an efficiency where the bathroom was right inside the front door, and then a tiny hallway into, well, everything else. 
I walk to the kitchen to get the water, and he points to the bathroom. Yeah, sure, dude. I have cleaning supplies. That's what they're for. So I go around the corner, pull out a couple of bottles of water from the fridge, come back, and he's standing there, butt naked, in my hallway. Then it dawns on me. Water. He was asking for a shower. Oh, God. Then he tries to ask me to join him. That was a hard no. He now goes into the shower, and I pace in my living room trying to figure out how the heck I can communicate to him that he needs to leave, because we went from uncomfortable to creeptastic in 0.06 seconds. Then it got worse. He comes out, again, but naked, without a towel, and begins wandering around my apartment commenting on everything. Oh, and, well, he's hard. Yeah, did I mention that part yet? I lose it, politely, because once you're in retail, that never goes away, trying to get him to put clothes on. He doesn't understand me. I pull out my phone, pull up Google Translate, and show him the list of languages. He understood what I was asking, and selected Somalian. Goody. Progress. Now the things he's commenting on, in terrible half-English, is things like, you live alone? Does this TV work? No, no, no. Done. I type into Google Translate asking if he needed to call his friend or call apartment management. He gives me a thumbs up and then climbs into my loft bed. Guess I'm cleaning that too now. So I'm like, which one? Another thumbs up. Well, okay. So he either didn't get what I was trying to do with the app after all, or he can't read. Eventually, my lizard brain took a breather from panicking long enough for the logic part of my brain to take over, and I went to where his clothes were and pointed at them, then at the door. He got dressed and left. Simple. Done. Over. I shake for about two hours, drink a six-pack, and post what happened to Facebook. In that time, it dawns on me that I probably got staked for theft, so I spent another hour double and triple checking my security camera, which I originally got to check on my puppy I was training at the time for later use. The next day he was on the stairs again. I tried to be pleasant, but made it very clear with head shakes and a roundabout trip back down the stairs and back up the other flight on the other side of the building to my apartment that I wasn't going to help him again or be his buddy. Two days after that, he was there again. I told the landlady and she had him removed and I never saw him again. And before you ask, no, nothing was stolen. I moved to the exact opposite end of the city four months ago. So random naked homeless dude, let's not meet again. The psycho library stalker watched me for hours, and I'm a frequent visitor of this subreddit, and I decided to share a story of something that happened to me years ago. Now please excuse my English, as English is not my first language. Several years ago, I was about 19, female, and studying in college. During exam period, I would always go to the public library in the city center to study, they would have special places for students to study. This particular day, I'd went there with a classmate. It was a weekday, and I finished studying at about 2 p.m. I asked my classmate if she would mind if I left. She said no, so I packed my stuff and left the library. As I walked out of the library, I walked straight into the city center. As I left, I felt something brush up against me. Now, considering that I just walked out in the quiet library and into the crowded street, I brushed it off. I proceeded to walk through the center to get to my bus stop, and after about five minutes of walking, I couldn't seem to shake the feeling that something was too close to me. So I grabbed my phone, held it up, and looked into the screen to see if there's someone behind me. And that's when I saw this man, about 40 years old, walking behind me with his eyes set on me. I felt uncomfortable because he was giving me weird vibes. He just looked really off. He was walking with a limp while staring right at me. He was wearing a scarf with a suit jacket, really old track pants, and old gym shoes. 
I didn't think he was homeless or a junkie, he was just weird. But to be safe, I put my phone in my bag and put the bag over my other shoulder, away from him. That's when he walked up to me and started walking next to me. At this point I've been walking for about 10 minutes through the busy streets. He kept his eyes on me and was walking so close to me, as if me and him were walking together. Once I almost made it to the bus stop, I saw my bus drive off. I didn't want to wait for another bus at the bus stop and have this man wait with me or know which bus I'm taking. So I decided to continue walking to the central station, which was about 8 minutes away. As I crossed the street, I noticed the man kept walking and didn't cross the street. I felt relieved and pulled out my phone to text my mom that some weirdo had been following me for about 15 minutes at that point. Not even a minute later, this man comes running out of an alleyway right in front of me. I almost tripped when I saw him and he kept walking in front of me. Every 10 seconds, literally I counted, he would abruptly turn his head back to look at me. I had even made a small snapchat video of it. At this point I was so nervous, but I was almost at the central station, so I just kept going. That's when he stopped, turned around, and started talking to me. I saw you at the library, he said. I didn't respond. We were together at the library, he repeated. Again, I ignored him. He didn't get the hint and kept talking. Hey, where are you going? Are you going to the central station? I'm going there. I'm taking X bus. Which bus are you taking? At that point, I had enough. There were people walking by and nobody said anything. So I just ran straight to the central station and got on my bus. I sat behind the bus driver just in case this creep decided to run after me. I saw him looking around before getting on his bus. Once I was on the bus, I finally had a moment to think about what happened and I realized that this man had been sitting there at the library watching me for hours and watching me leave to go after me. I remember feeling uneasy all the time. But I ignored the feeling, thinking it was just nerves before the exams that were coming up. This experience really made me uncomfortable because I had been coming to this library to study for years. Even in high school, I would study there until 9pm and leave by myself in the dark. I can only imagine what would have happened if I had met him then. So psycho, library stalker, let's not meet again. So I used to live in a part of Memphis, Tennessee that was a little bit sketchy. It was right on the edge of what some would call the ghetto, but also there was a nearby area that was pretty secluded and desolate as I lived on the outskirts of the city, kind of near the industrial part of Rayleigh for anyone familiar. Anyway, I was an 8 year old boy when this happened and my sister was 5 years my senior. The two of us went for walks on occasion, this time we went to the back of the housing division and further than we'd gone before. This area was pretty dirty and desolate for such a city, just train tracks and a nearby industrial facility. Lots of dry tan grass coming through the spots in the railroad gravel. Lots of dusty crap people dumped illegally around the tracks. There even used to be a pack of stray dogs that walked around my neighborhood, but other than that, no people or cars would really ever be seen out there, not that far behind my neighborhood anyway. We were just walking along the tracks, talking, throwing rocks, when I saw some strange movement just beyond the tree line of the small wooded area, about 40 feet ahead and on the left a bit. I told my sister to look as we walked a bit closer. We had made it about 10 or 15 feet away from the wooded area when we realized the movement was in fact a mime of all things, in the middle of nowhere, seemingly hidden amongst the trees and thick dead vines that adorned the edge of the wooded area. Painted face, black striped shirt with black pants. He had the exaggerated expression of a mime too. His eyes got really wide and he seemed to start performing for us for a moment. He was kind of doing it in a way to, I guess, attract us, maybe entice us into the wooded area where he stood, or lurked for that matter. I honestly couldn't tell you much about him as we ran away quickly. 
I do however remember that it was very hot outside that day and his makeup was pretty dingy and gross, as were his clothes. Now I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I assure you it happened, otherwise it would be on no sleep. I sometimes wonder who that mime was. I'm sure he wasn't there to kidnap children, but who knows what would have happened if we got into that thicket, and why there. He was just simply insane I think. His mind was gone, which is far more creepy than any kidnapping stranger that I've ever read about. This happened to me in college, when I lived with my roommate Michelle. It was our freshman year, and our dorm building had four different wings, and two were boys, and two were girls. Our wing was connected to another by a door down the hall, which led to a boy's wing. All floors in each wing were the same sex, and boys only had access to the girls' wings through the connecting door, which you had to have a key card for. They were locked at all times, and the key cards only worked for that dorm. I had known Michelle for a long time, and we loved the girls on our floor. We would all hang out often, during the week, and sometimes weekends. Whoever would be home would leave their door open so we could stop in and hang out, whatever. We never had a problem, and sometimes guys would take shortcuts to their wing from campus through our floor. No big deal. And we got to know the guys who did this often. Most often they all said hey if our doors were open and continued on their way. One day, our friend April got quiet when there were about six of us in our room and I noticed. I asked her what was the matter and she said, Dude, did you not see the guy that walked by? I've seen him before. He's creepy and never says anything, just stares at us. We all looked at each other and said no. She shrugged and said if he came by again, she would let us know. About an hour later, after watching some of a reality show, she hits Michelle in the arm. We all look up, and there is a tall guy with longer hair, wearing all black, walking slowly by. He says nothing and stares at us, but looks away when we all look. He leaves, and we look at each other. We chalk this up to him being lost, since we haven't seen him before and resume watching television. I talked to Michelle later though, and we agreed to keep a lookout and let the rest of the girls know to do the same, just in case. We begin to see this dude on our floor all the time, sometimes multiple times a day. It began to get ridiculous when we would all be changing and getting ready to go out, and he would walk by three to four times, doing nothing but staring and walking slower than necessary. Once he walked by six times, and we moved to one room and shut the doors. He clearly lived in the building because his key car worked in the locked door and he would be there daily. We began feeling uncomfortable leaving our doors open even when there were multiple people home and doing so. We asked the guys we knew across the hall on our floor if he lived there, but no he didn't and they actually got concerned when we told them what was going on. One of the RAs on one of the guy's floors said that if it continued or got weirder to talk to our RA, he offered to try to find out where this dude lived for us. I like to say it didn't get weirder, but it did. One day I went to our dorm computer room to print off notes for a psych class and prep a project I was going to turn in at the end of the week. Creepy bro sits next to me and starts surfing the net as I'm sitting down doing my thing on the computer. I felt ice cold. Everyone had laptops before tablets were a thing, and it felt odd that he arrived almost at the exact same time. So I printed my stuff off and leave quickly. I then head to my psych class, and as I get to the psych building, walk to my class, I notice he had followed me. I was stressed out the entire class and left from a different exit in the lecture hall, but he was still milling around as I left and I hope to God he didn't see me as I practically ran home. I get back, breathless, and Michelle asks what's wrong. I tell her, and she looks spooked. I go, what? And she shows me her Facebook. Creeper friended her, and his name is listed as Juan, and the photo is from his underwear. I check mine, same thing. We knock on a few girls' doors. Six other people also got friended, so we said nope to that practically rounded our RA's door down 
and said what had been going on, and I told her what just happened to me at class. One of the other girls swore he followed her as well. She panicked and said to block him online and she would take care of it. After that, we never saw him again. We don't know what they did, but he wasn't on our floor for the rest of the year and never really found out where he lived in the building. Our RA told us later there wasn't anyone named Juan in the entire building. So Juan, let's not ever meet again. I used to ride a motorcycle as a sole method of transportation when I was studying and I used to work on hotel cocktail bars during the summer holidays. Six years ago, I was working at a historic, stereotypically grand hotel in a very rural area of the UK. I worked a long afternoon and evening into the night, finished cleaning up the bar around 2am, and walked through the underbelly of the hotel to retrieve my motorcycle and make the journey home. I can still clearly remember the feeling of the crisp night air and the absolute pitch black silence of the countryside after the hot and seemingly never ending nights of serving drinks to dinner goers and party goers. It was always sort of intensely relaxing now that being an adult meant not being scared of the dark or being outside on a motorcycle in the middle of nowhere at 2am. Riding through the local town took me a few minutes before I left to follow the dark country roads home. At this point, I rode a Honda 125cc around 11 horsepower. Basic and old, but clean. It did the job, regardless of its quirks, such as the dim headlight which would dim and flicker even more when coming to a stop. I was riding along these pitch black roads with fields and woods surrounding me, very much alone, for about 20 minutes. Then I saw a brief blast of bright blue headlights in my mirrors coming from behind me. Moments later, dazzling headlights arrived behind me in seconds. Almost immediately, a large Range Rover pulls out to overtake me, blasting past barely inches away. I respond with a long blast of my horn, but this was a big mistake. The Range Rover pulls in front of me and slams on the brakes in what seemed like an attempt to have me lose control under sudden braking or rear end the range. Bikes can, even when they're old and rely on Trump brakes, stop pretty quickly, so I didn't rear end the maniac in front. I came to a controlled stop, but then I see the door of the range crack open and a figure began to step out. I went for it, using all the 11 horsepower of the little Honda's power, pulling an overtake. However, in those moments, this anger crazied maniac had shut his door and stepped on the accelerator, causing us to be level and accelerating together when I reached his car. He then started to run me off the road, pulling to the right, wedging me further over toward the ditch at the side of the road. This is where I ended up, struggling to control the bike on the wet, dew-heavy grass around the side of the road, trying to stop the 140 kilogram motorcycle dropping into the ditch. I struggled to regain balance, but managed to pull the bike back onto the road. At this point, I noticed the guy got back out of the Range Rover and walked around to the back, opened it, and was reaching inside. I had turned the bike to face the other side of the road, ready to turn either way and make an escape from the escalating situation. Just as I looked to turn, I took one more look over at him to see him pulling a large, long object out of the back of the range. I just went for it, taking another glance over my shoulder after 200 meters to see it begin to continue driving up the road away from where I'd run off the road. I slowed down to see what he'd do next after driving away from me. He reached the top of the road and pulled over to the left, waiting for me, the lights reflecting on the road. It was really eerie. My heart was beating so fast, yet it felt like time had just stopped. I just carried on in the opposite direction to find an alternative route home in the pitch black. But just before doing this, I checked my phone for signal to see I had no mobile coverage at all. This happened back when I was in college, about seven to eight years ago. I went to a community college in a relatively small town. 
With it being a small town, there was not really much to do if you were a night owl under the legal drinking age. My friends and I would frequently have late night adventures, consisting of long walks at 2 in the morning or going to the 24 hour grocery store. Not the most exciting or smartest thing to do, but at the time we thought it was better than being cooped up in the dorms all night. One night, me and two other friends, Kate and Elliot, decided we were going to go to the grocery store for snacks and mess around. We left our dorm at around 1am or so, so there weren't really many people around other than a few workers and some random customers. My friends and I were down at the pet aisle joking around. Kate and I dared Elliot to stick his head through one of the cat toys. He tried, but couldn't fit, and said, My head is too big for the hole. Before we could respond, some skinny, seedy-looking guy with a shaved head popped out of nowhere and breathingly said, I've heard that before, while leering at Kate and me. None of us really knew how to respond to this creep, so we just awkwardly laughed and got the heck away from him. Later, as we continued to walk around the store, we kept seeing this guy everywhere. He was following us, but trying to be casual and not obvious about it, and doing a terrible job because we noticed right away and kept trying to get away from him. We were really sketched out at this point, so we decided to check out and leave. I noticed that he is also just happening to finish up his shopping and was checking out nearby. Kate decided we should slow down a bit and let him leave before we did. He finished up and walked out of the store, and we thought we were finally rid of this weirdo. After we exited the store and got in the car, we noticed a rusty jeep idling across the parking lot with its lights on. Kate, who was driving, put the car in drive and started to pull out of her space. But suddenly, the jeep revved up and tore across the parking lot right at us. She freaked out and floored it. Both cars raced across the nearby empty parking lot until she sped out onto the main road. Thankfully, we had a bit of a head start on this guy, and she was able to pull into a subdivision where we finally lost him. We drove around the subdivision for a little bit, and after about 10 minutes without seeing this guy, we went back to the college. Thankfully, we never had an experience like this ever again. Late night creepy guy? Let's never meet again. I lived in the same trailer for most of my life. We moved there after my grandmother passed away and lived there for about 14 years. I was always picked on by the neighbors, so I didn't ever want to leave the house when people were outside. When I found out we were moving, I was ecstatic. You mean I'll actually be able to go out and get some air without being confronted with people mooing at me? Sign me the hell up. We moved about a town over on this long street, so I would have plenty of space to walk around if I wanted. Seeing as how I was new to the place and bored out of my skull for not having everything of mine moved out yet, I invited a friend over and we went walking that street. We see one of the neighbors a few houses down, washing his bright red truck. I can't really go into more detail, I'm not a car guy. He stopped to make conversation. Oh. Did you guys just move in? In that sort of way. Nothing seemed off about the guy. A few weeks pass and I walk that street again. I am confronted by the same guy. Hey, you want a job? It pays $20 an hour. Uh, no. Considering this is the second time I've ever spoken to this guy. No, I don't want your shady ass job. Visibly not having any of this, I try to get out of the conversation without too much fuss. I figured that would be the end of it because he probably saw the guy he met twice, was really not comfortable talking to him and leave me alone. Wrong. A while later I pass by his house again. He isn't outside. I go for a short walk and when I come back the way I came, there he is, smoking a cigarette out on his front porch. He asks if I thought about his job offer. I say, no, I'm still thinking about it. To which he starts grilling me. For $20 an hour, what's there to think about? After clearly not wanting anything to do with this, he threatens to report me. 
but to what? The only thing I've been able to think of is it might be unemployment, which given I'm not on unemployment, I would say they don't care. Winter strikes. It's about 9 p.m., going stir crazy inside. I need some air. I don't want to walk all the way down the hill I live on because I'd rather not slip and fall. Reluctantly, I walk my street. When passing by that house, I see him staring out his window. I pass by his house a few more times before getting creeped out and heading to the other side of the street. After walking around there for a little while, I see this guy from afar. He comes running from his house, stopping on the street looking for something. I stand in the dark waiting for him to go back inside. Don't ask me why I did this, because to be perfectly honest, I kick myself for it to this day. I decide to walk that road one more time just to get the rest of the energy out of my system. I would then head back inside and not think about this crazy mofo ever again. Passing by his house, still staring out his window, after passing by his house, he comes out for a cigarette. I deliberately try to avoid him. Noticing this, he pulls on the screen door of his house. It makes a lot of noise so I hear the door open. Not being an idiot, I know he did this to make me think he went back inside. I decide, alright, enough of this game. I'll walk past and just go home. And of course, he tries to talk to me about the job. You could afford shoes that fit if you had that job of mine. I've been wearing shoes I got from a friend because nobody else in their house was using them. Big old winter boots. I ignore him, after which he swears at me. I have totally stopped walking on that road. However, my mom had seen him pulling up to me when her and I were bringing laundry out to the car. Upon seeing me, he slows to a seeming stop and looks as if he wants to say something. Upon seeing my mom, he decides that it isn't a good idea and drives off. I do not plan to walk this road again if I don't have to. His truck is usually gone on the weekdays, so I figure those days I'm safe. However, if I ever have to walk that road, as it's a much faster way to get into town, I definitely try to have music blaring through headphones, just so that if he is there, I don't notice him and I can carry on with my day without even thinking about the gigantic creep that lives down the road. So creepy guy with a job. You can take that job and shove it up your ass. But let's not meet again, you weirdo. I am a process server. If you don't know what that is, I basically deliver legal papers to people at their home or place of work. These papers could be anything from foreclosures to subpoenas to child support papers, etc. I have to serve papers to plenty of criminals and just sketchy people in general, so I always try to be very careful. Sometimes I serve papers at night because people tend to be home more often after 5 p.m. Sometimes I have to serve papers to people who live way out in the woods, in the middle of nowhere. These people are my least favorite to serve now, and I will explain why. A few months ago, I had to serve a paper to someone who lived way out in the woods. I probably drove 25 minutes out into the middle of nowhere. It was also when there was still snow on the ground, and it was really dark out. I live in one of the most northern states, so winters are pretty brutal. The situation already made me nervous because I was in the middle of nowhere, and I had bad cell phone reception. If my car, let's say, broke down or got a flat tire, I would be in major trouble. But once I started to pull up to the house, I decided not to pull all the way into the driveway because it didn't look well plowed and I didn't want to get my car stuck. They had a short driveway that went up to a tall fence, so the back of my car was sticking out a few inches toward the road because I didn't pull all the way in. When I went to walk up towards the house, I realized the fence was padlocked and it was too tall to go over. There was really no way for me to get to the house, unless of course I broke the padlock or somehow climbed up the fence. I was pretty sure the house wasn't being used though, so I decided to just leave. I got back in my car and tried to back out, 
but my front tires that were on the driveway got stuck in the snow. I tried to turn my tires different directions and it seemed to be working a little bit. I kept doing that and then went forward a bit and then back again and tried to wiggle my way out. I was doing that for what seemed like forever, probably only five minutes, and then I started to get really nervous. I pulled a shovel out of my trunk and started to scoop the snow out from under my car. Once I thought it was good enough, I tried to back out again. It seemed to work, a little bit, but it wasn't enough to fully get my car unstuck. Then I saw a truck start to drive up the road. At first, I almost was happy because I thought nobody would be out here. They slowed down when they saw my car and then started to drive over to my side of the road. I assumed they were going to get out or roll down their window and ask if I needed assistance. I turned around to wait for the truck to stop, but instead of pulling over to the side of the road, they parked directly behind my vehicle. I remember how my stomach sank and I got this really terrible feeling in my gut. They pulled the truck directly and closely behind my car so I couldn't back up, even if I tried. If I had tried to back out of that spot, I would have t-boned them in reverse. I had to turn my body around to try to see the driver. They didn't get out or roll down their window. They just sat in the truck, blocking me in. Now, I couldn't see the driver very well because it was dark, but I knew it was a man. I think he was waiting for me to get out of my vehicle, but I just sat there and kept my doors locked. We sat there for what felt like a really long time, but was probably only a couple of minutes, when another car starts driving up the road. The truck then starts to drive out from behind my vehicle and starts going up the road before the other car reaches mine. The car doesn't stop but keeps on driving behind the truck. This is when I see the truck pull over on the side of the road and waits for the other car to drive by. This is also when I decided I had to get out of this driveway because I was not waiting for that truck to come back for me. I put my car in reverse and instead of trying to inch it out, I literally slammed on the gas and my car shot out of the driveway backwards. I almost went into the ditch on the other side of the road, but I slammed on my brakes just in time. I then slammed on the gas again and drove my car in the opposite direction of the truck. I looked in my rearview mirror once while driving away and saw that the truck had started to drive away in the other direction. I was so relieved but instantly my eyes started tearing up because I didn't really know what just happened. I can't say what the other person was going to do, but deep in my gut I felt like I just escaped something terrible. So creepy guy in the truck, let's not meet again. And to everyone who has to drive for their job at night and anyone else that is driving at night in general, please be careful and please be cautious. The road is a dangerous place for many reasons. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saltil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, 
take care and have yourself an amazing day.